us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, the free eternal King, the good shepherd and leader of the rational flock, who didst lay down thy life for thy sheep, thou hast said, Where two or three are gathered in my, in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Do thou thyself now be present in this gathering through the grace of thy Holy Spirit, and manifest thy servant Nicodemus, who has been established as an archimandrite, to be a good and esteemed member of this community. Make straight his path, enlighten his mind, and plant in his heart thy fear, that he may live blamelessly and according to thy holy will, faithfully and honestly serving the needs of this holy house, and striving for its well-being with all his strength. Keep his soul and body from every danger, and manifest him to be an inheritor of thy kingdom. For thou art our Savior, and unto thee we send thy glory and worship, and give us thy fatherhood without beginning, and thine all holy and good and mighty spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of the ages. Amen. And most blessed Master, the grace of the all Holy Spirit, through our mediocrity, elevates you to the archimandrite of the honorable habitation of St. Nicholas. Axios. Axios.
Washington, Archbishop of Washington, Metropolitan of All America and Canada,
the holy apostle Paul to the Galatians. Blessed Brethren, see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these try to compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Brethren, every high priest is ordained to offer both gifts and sacrifices. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as other priests to offer sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once in offering himself. For the law maketh men priests who have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son who is perfected forevermore. Now this is the sum of the things of which we have spoken. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the holies and of the true tabernacle which the Lord hath erected. And not man. Alleluia, the fifth tone. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. I will sing of thy mercies, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim thy truth from generation to generation.
him, what is written in the law, how readest thou? Answered said, and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, and leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, the Levite, when he was at this place, came and looked at him, and passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and he, went, and he saw him, and had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him, that fell among the thieves. And he said, He showed mercy on him. That said Jesus unto him, Go and do likewise. The Lord said to the Jews that came to him, For judgment I come into this world, that they which see might not see, that which might not be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Verily I say unto you, he that fall but climb in some other way, that same is the thief and the robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porteth open, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth to his own. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily I am the door of the sheep, and that ever came me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep, I did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enters in, he shall be saved, and go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not for me to kill and to destroy. I, I am come that they may have life, that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gave his life for the sheep. But he is a hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and flee. And the wolf catches them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling flee, because he is a hireling, and care not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, and one shepherd.
Jesus what she should do to inherit eternal life. And as we soon see, the lawyer, in fact, already knows the answer to his own question. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. But the lawyer does not want to accept this simple answer, this answer that he already knows. Who is my neighbor, he asks. Somehow the straightforward teaching of the law does not satisfy this man's need for confusion, for complication. The truths of the faith are uncomplicated, but he demands complexity. And in this demand for complexity and ambiguity, we are so often inclined to imitate that certain lawyer. Violent aggression is evil, and yet we may find ourselves wishing to pronounce Solomonic judgments involving a shared claim rather than unambiguously condemning a bloody invasion of war crimes following in its wake. God made man male and female, and said that a man shall leave his mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. And yet we may find ourselves following the views of the world, calling into question these manifest truths of the divine ordering of creation. Of course, Christians are called to be prudent, discerning, attentive to particular circumstances, comfortable with ambiguity, walking humbly before the Lord. <coughs> Nevertheless, in monastic context, from the Slavic Middle Ages through to St. Paisius of Athos in our own day, we find that the holy voices of our tradition consistently lift up simplicity and show suspicion of complexity which is often equated with craftiness. This is because so often complexity is a tool used by the devil. He uses complexity to turn our attention away from love of God and love of neighbor, away from the effort to realize this love in our life on a daily basis. Instead, he desires to turn our attention towards various unprofitable externalities that lie beyond our control. Holy simplicity, on the other hand, involves accepting the world as it is, to the extent that we know it. We accept the truths of divine revelation and also the limits of our knowledge. We accept the law of God and the imperatives of the gospel and also the fact that from time to time there may be hard cases. True simplicity, then, is an antidote both to the pride of certainty and also to the temptations of clever ambiguity. Moreover, whereas complexity can often be used to justify our sins and ratify our distorted desires, Simplicity brings us back to the fundamental truths of the spiritual life. We are sinners in need of God's mercy and grace, and yet we must struggle to fulfill the divine precepts with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Simplicity in the Orthodox Christian tradition is not obscurantism or proud ignorance or refusal of genuine thought. Rather, simplicity is the mark of a life discerningly focused on what is most important, eternal life, the wholehearted service of God, and authentic mercy toward our neighbor. To live with holy simplicity calls us back to the basics, back to Christ, day in and day out. We might say that to live simply is to have life and to have it more abundantly. To live each day with gratitude and contrition, attentive to the Lord and our neighbors. And this is, after all, the Lord's will for each of us. This is why he came into the world, so that we could have life, so that we can live. He did not die on the cross for us to become mired in webs of complexity. He died so that we could be liberated from the nets of the world and the snares of the devil. He died and rose in order to set us free 
to be alive as human beings made in God's image and likeness. As I look back on the last 10 years of my primacy of the Orthodox Church in America and look forward to what may come, I have found myself asking, perhaps like that certain lawyer, what shall we do? Amid all the troubles of the world, the troubles of our nation, the troubles among local churches, what is the mission and vocation of the Orthodox Church in America? And today I would like to propose that maybe the simplest and most straightforward answer is also the best. Our vocation as the Orthodox Church in America is simply to be Christians and to strive to be better Christians. Our calling is to live more faithfully in accord with the holy tradition of Orthodox Christianity. And that is my heartfelt hope for each of you on this 10th anniversary of my election as primate. May we, all of us, each of us, strive to live more simply, more faithfully. Being in church more, celebrating more services, spending more time at prayer, becoming more generous in our tithing and almsgiving, giving more time to those we love, to our neighbors, to the poor and to strangers, undertaking pilgrimages, honoring holy icons and relics, participating more frequently and more fervently in the mysteries of confession and communion. This is our answer to the question, what shall we do? What shall we as the Orthodox Church of America do to live out our calling and inherit eternal life despite the tribulation and confusion that surrounds us, we shall do everything in our power to lead abundant lives as Orthodox Christians. This focus on living our lives simply, focused on the daily aspects of Christian life, does not mean that we will ignore the communal dimension of our existence or pretend that the world's problems don't exist. It means that we will ground our existence, our lives from day to day, in the most important realities. And firmly grounded in those realities, our life will no longer be controlled by external events. We will no longer find ourselves agonized by complexity. Instead, we shall live more abundantly each day, focused on God and neighbor, cheerfully accepting God's commandments as well as our own crosses, placing all our hope in Christ, opening ourselves more and more to the life He desires to share with us, abundant life in this world, and even more abundant life, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over in the age to come. And to Christ, our true God, the giver of life, be all glory, together with his Father, and his all holy and life-giving spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. deacons and all other clergy and for all our brethren in Christ.
of this holy monastery, our commandrate Sergius, with all his brotherhood in Christ. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Again we pray for this country, its president, for all civil authorities, and for the armed forces. Patriarchs, and for the blessed and ever memorable founders of this holy habitation, for the newly departed Archbishop Chrysostomos, Archpriest John, Priest Andrew, Anne, Peter, Catherine, Elizabeth, Child Sophia, Lubov, Lydia, Peter, May, John, Democratia, Julia, Eric, Stephen, Richard, Ranitza, Andrew, Rose, Basil, Judy, and Doug, and for Proto Presbyter Joseph, and for all of our fathers and brethren, the Orthodox departed this life before us who here and in all the world lie asleep in the Lord. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Again we pray for mercy, life, peace, health, salvation, and visitation for the brotherhood of this holy monastery, for the seminarians, faculty, administration, staff, alumni, trustees, pilgrims, uh, and their family, this holy habitation, and for the pardon and remission of their sins. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Again we pray for those who bring offerings and do good works in this holy and all-venerable temple, for those who labor and those who sing, and for all the people here present who raise thy great and rich mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Après de ton Dieu, miséricordieux et ami de l'homme, et nous te rendons gloire, Père, Fils et Saint-Esprit, maintenant et toujours et dans les siècles des siècles. the faithful again and again in peace pray unto the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help us, save us, have mercy on us, and keep us, O God, by thy grace. Lord have mercy. Wisdom.
hath danger and necessity, let us wait for the Lord.
Orthodox Patriarchs, Bartholomew of Constantinople, Theodorus of Alexandria, John of Antioch, Theophilus of Jerusalem, Kirill of Moscow, Ilya of Georgia, Porfiry of Serbia, Daniel of Romania, and Nerfit of Bulgaria, the most holy Orthodox, Metropolitans and Archbishops, Yeruni of Athens, Anastasius of Albania, Slava of Warsaw, and Rostislav of the Czech lands and Slovakia, May the Lord God remember his kingdom always, now, and ever, and unto ages of ages. The Holy Synod of Bishops of the Orthodox Church in America, His Eminence the Most Reverend Nathaniel, Archbishop of Detroit and the Romanian Episcopate, His Eminence the Most Reverend Benjamin, Archbishop of San Francisco and the West, His Eminence the Most Reverend Mark, Archbishop of Philadelphia and Eastern Pennsylvania, his Eminence, the Most Reverend Alejo, Archbishop of Mexico City and Mexico. His Eminence, the Most Reverend Tiffany, Archbishop of Ottawa and the Archdiocese of Canada. His Eminence, the Most Reverend Michael, Archbishop of New York and the Diocese of New York and New Jersey. His Eminence, the Most Reverend Alexander, Archbishop of Dallas, the South and the Bulgarian Diocese. His Grace, the Right Reverend Alexei, Bishop of Sitka and Alaska. His Grace, the Right Reverend. Andre, Bishop of Cleveland, His Grace, the Right Reverend Gerasim, Bishop of Fort Worth, His Eminence, the Most Reverend Archbishop of Melchizedek, Archbishop of Pittsburgh in Western Pennsylvania. May the Lord God remember His kingdom always, now, and ever, and unto ages of ages. The Honorable Priesthood, the Diaconate in Christ, the whole priest of monastic order. May the Lord God remember His kingdom always, now, and ever, and unto ages of ages. The Right Reverend Archimandrite Sergius in the Monastery in Christ, the Brotherhood in Christ with him. May the Lord God remember in his kingdom always, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Metropolitan of North America. May the Lord God remember his kingdom always, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. You and all Orthodox Christians, may the Lord God remember his kingdom always, now and ever, and unto the ages of wrath, danger, and the 
necessity, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help us, save us, have mercy on us, and keep us, O oh God, by thy grace. Lord, have mercy. That the whole day may be perfect, holy, peaceful, and sinless, let us ask of the Lord.
us a tent that we may offer the holy oblation in peace.
to be remembering our most holy, pure, and most blessed and glorious Lady, the birth gift of God and ever Virgin Mary.
who with diligence and in the fear of God do labor and serve for the healing of the sick, for the repose, pardon, blessed memory, and forgiveness of sins of all Orthodox who have fallen asleep, for the salvation of all the people here present and of each of those whom they have in mind, and for all mankind. And for all mankind. Make glorify and praise your all honorable and majestic name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and for unto ages of ages. Saints, again and again in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. All the precious gifts now offered and sanctified, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Our God, who loves mankind, having received them upon his holy and noetic altar above the heavens as a sweet spiritual fragrance, will send down upon us in return his divine grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Lord, we may be delivered from all affliction, wrath, danger, and necessity. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help us, save us, have mercy on us, and keep us, O God, by thy grace. Lord, that the whole day may be perfect, holy, peaceful, and sinless, let us ask of the Lord. Lord. An angel of peace, a faithful guide, a guardian of our souls and bodies, let us ask of the Lord. and remission of our sins and transgressions, let us ask the Lord. This, o Lord. All things that are good and profitable for our souls and peace for the world, let us ask of the Lord. This, o Lord. That we may complete the remaining time of our life in peace and repentance, let us ask of the Lord. Christian ending to our life, painless, blameless, and peaceful, and a good defense before the dread judgment seat of Christ, let us ask. Having asked for the unity of the faith and the communion of the Holy Spirit, let us commend ourselves and each other and all our life unto Christ our God.
unto the Lord. Together with our own holy, good, and love giving spirit now and ever, and unto ages of angels.
camest into the world to save sinners of whom I am first. I believe also that this is truly thine own most pure body, and this is truly thine own precious blood. Therefore I pray thee, have mercy upon me, and forgive my transgressions, both voluntary and involuntary, of word, and word, and deed, committed to knowledge or in ignorance, and make me worthy to partake without condemnation of thy most pure mysteries, for the remission of my sins, and unto life everlasting. Amen. Of thy mystical supper, O Son of God, accept me today as a communicant, for I will not speak of thy mysteries to thy enemies. Neither like Judas will I give thee a kiss, but like the feet will I confess thee. Remember me, O Lord, in thy kingdom. May the communion of thy holy mysteries be neither to my judgment nor to my condemnation, O Lord, but to the healing of the soul of my body.
having partaken of the divine, holy, most pure, immortal, heavenly, life-giving, and dread mysteries of Christ, let us worthily give thanks unto the Lord.
clergy, pious, faithful, and monastics. Christ is in our midst. He is in our midst. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to God. How good it is for brothers to dwell together in peace. My privilege as senior bishop, on behalf of my fellow bishops, to offer some thoughts on the remembrance and celebration today for the 10th anniversary of the election of our Beatitude, his Beatitude, Econ, as the 21st First Bishop of the now Autocephalous Orthodox Church in America and of the present Holy Synod of Ken Diocesan and two auxiliary bishops. On November 24th, most citizens of the United States of America will celebrate an annual day of Thanksgiving, even as our brethren in Canada have so recently. Some say this day of national Thanksgiving began in Plymouth, Massachusetts, in 1621, when settlers and the Wampanoaga tribe shared a meal together. Others proposed 1619 in Berkeley, Virginia. That goes to our new Another said was in Florida in 1565 when the Seloy tribe, who were Spanish settlers, shared the fish tackles together. <laughs> a day of national thanksgiving is a tradition over 400 years. The question arises as to whom, and for what, and why is thanks to be given. Today is our OCA Day of Thanksgiving for our Metropolitan. Reviewing the secular celebration, we find good answers on the questions posed. President Abraham Lincoln, in his proclamation October 3rd and 18. 63, and signed a day of national giving thanks to God for his benefits and because it is due to him as sovereign ruler of all. I've taken a few lines from that proclamation and reflection on the basis for the National Day of Thanksgiving and for our day today. The year, quoting from Lincoln, the year that is drawing toward a close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties, which are also constantly enjoyed, that we are, prepared, we are prone to forget the source from which they come. Others have been added, which are of extraordinary nature, that they cannot feel fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which habitually is insensible to this ever watchful presence of Almighty God. In the midst of a civil war of unqualified magnitude and severity, order has been maintained, the laws have been respected and obeyed, and harmony has prevailed everywhere except in the theater of military conflict. Population has steadily increased, notwithstanding the waste that has been made in the camp, the siege, and the battlefield. No human, no human council has devised, nor has any martial hand, the mortal hand, worked out these great things. They are the great generous gift of the Most High God, with who all dealing with us in anger for our sins, has nevertheless remembered his mercy. It has seemed to us fit and proper that there should be a solemn and gratefully acknowledged day as with one heart and one voice given by the whole American people. I do therefore entreat my fellow citizens every part of the United States and even those who are far off and those who are journeying in foreign lands to set apart and preserve the last day of Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to the most beneficent Father, Father 
who dwells in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up the prescriptions of duty to him, due to him for such regular, singular adverse deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble men, uh, presence for our national perseverance and disobedience, recommend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the midst of the civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged, and fervently implore the Most High, the Holy One, to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore as soon as only possible to be consistent with the divine purposes and the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. Signed by President Abraham Lincoln and by the Secretary of State, um, uh, the Secretary of State, who later, as we know, signed on March 30th, 1867, just two years later, the agreement to purchase Alaska from Russia for seven million. $7.2 million. And the uh, laying of the cornerstone for our holy other sepsis for collection. He states, our population is destined to roll over resistant waves to the ice barriers of the north and to encounter oriental civilization. It resumes them to mean Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Christians. For their part, the Alaska natives claim that they, are, they still own the land, of course, entitled to the territory as its original inhabitants, and having not lost through war, nor ceded it to any country, including the U.S., which uh, technically then didn't buy it from the Russians, but they brought the right to negotiate with the indigenous population. Just a reminder. <laughs> so, excuse me for bringing uh, this up, uh, our celebration of Beatitude and Grace of Alexei, but somehow it seems to be uh, a concern for the Mother Diocese of Alaska, who also is also the place where the, his Beatitude <coughs> was once greeted by an inquisitive Adam. Certain <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Perhaps your ancestors were present at one of the early days of Thanksgiving, or later on read in the newspaper of Lincoln's proclamation. Where the rest of us, our ancestors, <coughs> in the surroundings of their villages and old world cities, thanking God in their orthodox Christian manner. Thanks to that Almighty God, the Most High God. Father, and Father, in the words of uh, Lincoln. Today we are all rendered thanks to Him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, for Your loving and faithful leadership in 2012. I brought up the Lincoln uh, reflection because we, the bishops of 12 dioceses and two auxiliary bishops, and by including the clergy and faithful of the Archdiocese of Washington, uh, 13 uh, are near to the celebration that national holiday of celebration. We are here now gathered to give thanks to God for your service and primacy to Christ's church for the previous 10 years. A unique event, a celebration which the great God will be bestowed and celebrated year after year for many, many years. Growing up alive. Although you and the youngest, you are the youngest bishop in age, you are, although many don't know, senior in ordination. Yes, well, he's in it. Your ordination into the Episcopacy in 2004 and February 14 boosted you to the top of the rank, even over the venerable Archbishop Benjamin. May 11th and Mark, December 5th, and uh, his eminence Alexo in May 2005. 
You are 10 years as Metropolitan and 18 years as Bishop of the Church. And certainly the Electoral Council took consideration both of your youth and your experience in the Episcopal life at our election. A rapid overview of the early years of, of, your, uh, of your life reveals that until now, you enjoy traveling. <laughs> Connecticut, France, Missouri, Reading, PA, Lancaster, PA, Chicago, Illinois, and then to a temporary permanent PA celebration, or rather uh, connection, South Canaan. And uh, it was there in South Canaan, the Diocese of Eastern PA, she became the first subsidiary bishop. And then went off to be Bishop of Philadelphia and Eastern PA. A question arises, is Eastern and Western PA like North and South Dakota? Or North and South Carolina? Or Virginia and West Virginia? And then for 10 years, Nestling down to the grand abode of many rooms and windows situated in the glorious Syosset. It's come to the attention of uh, bishops, clergy, faithful, and monastics that recently, just before this celebration, you have put on your luggage new Orthodox Church in America tag. Reading. Washington District of Columbia, to which we, as I say, proud. Let us come now forward that and uh, <laughs> push me away. <laughs> Let us from now on forward take root, having having migra immigrated, migrated to and from North Alaska then south to California, then east to New York, and now snuggled in the uh, central basin of the Potomac River. <coughs> so from uh, November 13th, 2012, your title now redounds with clarity and authenticity. Tikon, Archbishop of the capital city of Washington, District of Columbia, Metropolitan, of all America and Canada. Over the decades, you have given most generously, uh, inviting us, the Holy Spirit and others, to numerous meetings and events for which we thank you. Sometimes attending, sometimes not. But you are there. On occasion, you call us to the Holy Chrism of Multiplius ingredients, a unique event indeed. Your presence at various and numerous meetings, shared, uh, sharing this one and that, cyberfigural and non cyberfigural from which you do not share about shrink. Then you, your role on various international assemblies and external assemblies, weighs heavy on your shoulders, and demands authentic humility. On occasion, you do say, well, Let's put that one aside for the moment and concentrate on what's before us. You have brought the holy ark of Christ to harbor in this ambitious and restless city on the Potomac. And with you, the hope of the Holy Synod of your present uh, 12 brethren, that your youth endures for years to come, your wisdom continues to be shared with all fellow bishops, clergy, faithful, and monastics, the one body of Christ. Although you do not pretend, pretend to be or to say, or be at all, your proclamations are of such kind. These are some uh, witnesses to your dedication for that which you are thankful, beginning in 2012 and each year thereafter. Call for prayer in the wake of Connecticut school shooting. 
passed your letter concerning the Boston Marathon uh, uh, bombing. Call for prayers in the wake of the world events. Um, uh, concerning violence and extremism in the Middle East. Statement concerning your uh, June 2nd uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, decision. Public statement on the uh, Orlando shooting. In remembrance of our veterans, day of prayer for creation, Hurricane Harvey, on the, year, on the 16th anniversary of 9-11 attack, the response to Pittsburgh synagogue tragedy, Archpastoral letter on the coronavirus, and more recently, um, all that, those letters of concern. One notes that these statements do not uh, concern merely our autocephalous church, but of all society, for which we, we proclaim the good news to transfigure the, in this new age in which we presently abide. Ten years ago, on the first anniversary of your privacy, I wrote you these few words. We thank you for accepting the call of the Holy Synod to the primacy of the Holy Auto Settless Church. And on this first anniversary of your enthronement, we thank God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, for the, for the tribune mercy bestowed on us and you during the 12 previous months. Today, the Church of North America, our Orthodox Church in America, and the jurisdictional Episcopal uh, units offer their wishes, their prayers, that you have a long life and serve clarity of mind and guidance and good works as an example to the Orthodox in this, um, on this continent. Your presence is that of mercy. Is, your presence is not merely within the administration of our church, but is seen and noted by Orthodox churches or you affect the pleroma of the body of the church worldwide. You have experienced a difficult birth, embracing disturbances of the past, reaching out to all parishes to heal to all parties to heal wounds, sitting not in judgment but in presence, meeting and working out solutions. This work continues, and then by God's grace. He's coming in a resolution to these matters. Your election by the Holy Senate was that by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And you have as first hire of our church for whose, for whose good works the world uh, and glorifies our Father in heaven. The American Council embraced your election, your celebration, your elevation, your enthronement with thanksgiving to God. Do not remember the vaccination and this kind of approval. The sign of relief and thanksgiving. I do remember, and I'm deeply moved that you have you have been prepared for this high calling and that you have accepted it with humility, which means of course reality. You enjoy you bestow your strengths on the church and will benefit which benefits by them and you will be um, you will be upheld by the prayers of the higher bishops, clergy, monastics, and faith. So to the answer, to whom and for what and why, <laughs> I hope I have made it clear. Certainly our Holy Orthodox Church in North America continues to offer thanks to God for you, your service to us and fellow men, because you have the heart and as a sign of, uh, of our love for you and service, we offer to you, you know, I'll tell you that. <laughs> we have established, uh, and we put your post, I think, Metropolitan Charity and Endowment Foundation. And we begin that with $10,000. And we did some work with Andrew on that. And we we'll are going to have some of that. So that you know, 
loosen up your pocketbooks out there uh, and uh, we can give to the Metropolitan Charity Endowment Fund without reserve. Anything you want to give from $500 up. <laughs> Thank you all for being uh, kind and listening to me. I have a little problem with my eyesight. Now you can take it. Don't throw it away, just take it. <laughs> Thank you, Your Eminence. Your beatitude. Our beloved Abbot is sick with the COVID virus and regrets not being present to welcome your beatitude and the honorable hierarchs of the Holy Synod of the Orthodox Church in America and the clergy who have come to honor your beatitude on this special day of Thanksgiving that was described so well by Vladeko. We want to uh, extend Father Sergius's love for you and his gratitude for the paternal love and for your prayerful guidance in all the work here being accomplished in the mission of St. Tikhon's Monastery. The monastery continues to flourish and grow. And Father Sergius said, make sure you thank his beatitude for his leadership and for his guidance and his prayers. And I also would like to say that all of us here, St. Tikhon's community, are very honored with the dedication of your leadership, Ladiko, in serving our Orthodox Church in America. In 1990, you made your first visit in this very church to visit your colleague from the university, Bishop Alexis, who recently enrolled as a student. And from that moment, I believe, the Holy Spirit <coughs> touched your heart. And you felt at peace during your retreat here. And soon after you were enrolled, completed your studies being awarded the Master of Divinity degree, one of our first students. And from that point, you <coughs> gave your life here at the monastery as a humble monk. How many times did we hear you reading from the Quiddos? How many times did we witness you celebrating the Divine Liturgy and the Holy Sacraments here in our beloved community? I'm sure Vladika Michael, our rector, and our dean, Father John, join with me and all of our brethren of the community of St. Deacon Seminary and the monastery community are very honored and touched by your paternal love and your leadership. And be assured, dear Vladika, of our continued prayers that the Lord God will give you the grace and strength to bear the cross that has been placed upon you, that you will be unwavering in your love and your service to our Lord and to our Holy Church. And again, Father Sergius extends his greetings and his welcome to all the hierarchs who came to honor you. He's called anti Thank you, Father Daniel. I want to first express my thanks to His Eminence Archbishop Nathaniel for his very kind words on behalf of the entire Holy Synod and to thank all of my brothers for joining us not only this week for the Holy Synod meeting but for this beautiful <coughs> celebration of the Divine Liturgy and to express my thanks to uh, Father Daniel for conveying the greetings of our Commander Sergius and the Monastery Brotherhood as well as those of the seminary community and the St. Tikhon's wider community. It's truly a moving moment for me to be uh, standing here in this place, the, the monastery of my repentance, but also the seminary of my pastoral formation 
and the community where I uh, was introduced to the wider life of our, our parishes. Many people were uh, concerned that a monk might be elected bishop, because what does a monk know about parish life? But this community here, all of you, your parents and grandparents, those who are perhaps no longer with us, those that I uh, helped uh, to, to bury in the cemetery that I was a caretaker of for so many years, so many uh, of those prayers and that support I feel very much today, um, not only over the last 10 years of my primatial ministry, but uh, throughout my life in the church. So I'm truly <coughs> humbled and grateful to all of you for that support because um, you know, the primatial ministry is uh, sometimes uh, lonely and, and isolated and it's something that cannot be done humanly without God's grace and without the love and prayers of, of so many uh, around me. So I'm uh, truly touched and moved to uh, receive this uh, expression of your love and support today, but not only today, but every day of my life. I'm always grateful uh, for, for all of you <coughs> and your prayers and your love and support. Um, I do want to then express my gratitude um, as well. So one of the joys of serving as the primate of the Black Church of America is the ability uh, to bestow awards on those who have faithfully served Christ and his Holy Church in various capacities. This morning at the little entrance, I recognized two of our monastic clergy. Uh, I elevate Father Nicodem to the dignity of Archimandrite and bestowing the jewel cross upon Father Christopher. As a metropolitan, I also have the privilege of recognizing the talent and contributions of faithful laypersons who, often with no less zeal and dedication than the clergy, labor for the life and the health of the church and her people. Today, as the church honors me on the occasion of my 10th anniversary, I would like to recognize three individuals who have been of tremendous assistance and support both to me personally and to the broader Orthodox Church in America by bestowing upon these individuals the award that is at the sole discretion of the Metropolitan, the Order of St. Innocent. So I would ask um, Papadia Catherine Vitko to please come forward. successful in one area of life or have developed one particular talent that we can offer to our family, our church, and our community. You are truly one of those rare individuals who excels on multiple levels in many locations and always with a high level of professional <coughs> and churchly devotion. On the parish level, you were a co-founder of the Day Care Center at St. Michael the Archangel Parish in Concord, California where you also served as church school teacher, director, and parish council member. You continue your role as church school director in your present parish of St. Luke's. On the diocesan level, you served on the perception committee of the Diocese of the West, helping the parishes and the missions of the diocese to understand the role of the broader church structure. You also served as counselor of the Diocese of the West St. Eugene camp for 10 years and also served on the Diocese of the West Mission Board. In the Archdiocese of Washington, you currently serve as a co-chair of our mission board and were instrumental in spearheading the effort of the distinguished diocese and benefactors in raising funds to bring delegates from the Diocese of Alaska to the All-American Council. On the church-wide level, you were the parish delegate to the All-American Council in 1983, the first year that women were allowed to be delegates. You served three terms between 1987 and 2003 as diocesan delegate, and then six years as OCA at-large member more recently. You were one of the first women to serve on the administrative committee and also served as a member of the strategic planning committee as well as the Reconciliar Commission. 
In addition, we have devoted itself to many organizations such as the I San Francisco IOCC Committee, which you are a founding member of, and currently serving as a board member of the Orthodox Church Capital Improvement Fund. In the midst of all of that, you also served as a member of the OCA's Department of Christian Service and Humanitarian Aid for 10 years, organized and produced a video on St. Juvenali, and were co-organizer of parish ministry conferences, and completed the OCA's mission school in 2015. In fact, all of your work reveals you as a faithful missionary of the Orthodox Church in America, and for this and all your accomplishments, it is my joy to bestow upon you the order of St. Innocent, Silver class. Cindy Nectaria Heist to please come forward next. Cindy, when I first met you, you had arrived from the faraway lands of Hawaii to St. Tikhanath Monastery as a seeker of the truth and beauty of the Orthodox faith. It was here at the monastery that you were baptized and immersed yourself in the light of liturgy and prayer that is found here. For several years, you served at the Diocese of Eastern Pennsylvania as Director of Communications, where you were instrumental in renewing the communications of the diocese, both electronically and physically, especially in making the diocese and magazine Alive in Christ more accessible and visually appealing. At the same time, you had begun your work with children and youth, training for and engaging in the sometimes difficult and painful work of caring for families and children in crisis. With this work, you found your calling as an Orthodox Christian who has cared for the spiritual, mental, and physical well-being of her fellow human beings. You continued this ministry in an even more intense manner when you accepted to serve as the first coordinator of the Office of Review of Sexual Misconduct Allegations. Although this area of church life is often dark, heavy, and even a source of agony. <coughs> By the grace of God, you, Cindy, with your strong heart, clear thinking, and when necessary, strong voice, plunged into this world and provided guidance and wisdom to the bishops, chancellors, and clergy, and parish leaderships of, of the church. You persevered faithfully in this, even when faced with resistance, objections, and even anger and incomprehension. You persevered because your heart was, and continues to be, firmly planted in the life of Christ and the Orthodox faith that you so eagerly embraced many years before. Now, as you devote yourself to other sacred tasks, such as your family and iconography, it is fitting for us to recognize you for the work that you accomplished as coordinator of the office, often thankless work, but nonetheless sacred work. For there is nothing more sacred than the human person created in the image and likeness of God. All of us find ourselves straying from that image and likeness, and we rely on people to remind us of our high calling, to draw us from darkness to light, and to help us find healing for our brokenness. You, Cindy, are such a person, and we as a church, and I personally, are grateful for your service, and sincerely, I am pleased to bestow upon you the Order of St. Innocent Silver Class.
Finally, I would ask Al Rossi to come forward. <coughs>
Mexico. They had to go. They had a concert, so they had to leave. But we'll send our thanks to them and to the choir that is still here. Uh, thank you for your beautiful and prayerful singing that was truly made this a, a wonderful celebration of the Divine Liturgy.